All right, here we go. We have the legendary Roxanne Shantae in the building. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you for coming through. Big fan of you. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. I appreciate that. So, I really want you to tell your story. And let's go ahead and start in the beginning. Now, you grew up in Queensbridge. Yes. I grew up in Queensbridge Public Housing. Um, I have four sisters. I grew up on a block called 12th Street. And um, I was, I think I've always been a battle rapper for as long as I can remember. And um, it started there. Okay, now at what point you were in a group home? Yes, yes, I was placed in a group home um, from age 12 to 14. Okay, well, I mean, everyone I've ever talked to about being in a group home always talked about it being a really bad experience. I mean, how was that for you? Well, I mean, I was in Hegeman Girls Group Home located in, uh, but I was in a few of them really, but my last stop that I stayed the longest was Hegeman. And Hegeman, even though there was a lot going on, especially with the 80s, especially with crack first coming out and so many things going on in the streets and so many parents um, had stopped being parents. And so we started seeing really like that whole, I guess I want to say that tidal wave of families breaking apart. Um, Hegeman was actually pretty good. It wasn't as bad as uh, Bushwick Girls Group Home, which was the worst, and I was there also. But Hegeman was, wasn't that bad. It was, um, it was a fact of I made some of my greatest bonds there. I'm um, still uh, young ladies that I am best friends with. Like I, My best friends are from there, and I still have those same best friends today. And we still go through you know, life together. We were nicknamed the Hega Monsters. And um, the reason why they called us the Hega Monsters is because it was a way of separating us from the children, the other girls in the community. So this way, people would automatically know that we were group home girls. So they called you Hega Monsters. And regards to how pretty you were or how well behaved you were or how well spoken you were, the community did not want you to forget that you were from this group home. Yeah. Now what actually led up to you actually leaving your mother and going into a group home? Um, it was just the fact of um, being a being a true being a truant, there was a lot of um, a lot of other circumstances that led up to it. Okay. So you're in a group home. Yes, sir. And in the group home, was that when you really started rapping and battle rapping and so forth? No, actually, I started rapping from Queensbridge, from home. And once I got to the group home, um, every time you go somewhere, there's always somebody who can hit a beat up on the wall, like boom, boom, bat, boom, 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 bat. And then they wait to see who's going to MC or who's going to rhyme. And um, hip hop was actually our way of being able to cope with what our circumstances were and our situation was hip hop was an alternative to fighting each other. So we would battle from floor to floor, from dorm to dorm, from room to room. So if I had to say, were my skills honed in there? Absolutely. Did I get better at it being in the group home? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay, so you're battling other girls or guys as well? They would have guys come from around the projects like, um, actually, the only one who knew I was from a group home in the industry was Prince Marky D. And I remember my first time getting ready to perform with the Fat Boys, and he looked at me and he said, I know you, you the group home girl. And I was like, yeah. And he was like, they don't even know you from a group home, do they? And I was like, nope. And he was like, yeah, I should tell him. And I was like, yeah, well, go ahead. Go ahead. I don't, go ahead. You know, and, and I remember his face was like, nah, that's our secret. Don't worry, I won't tell it. So I told it because, you know, I just hate to have anybody have anything over my head. So I was like, listen, y'all, my name is Roxanne Chante. I was straight out the group home. They was like, oh, good, me too. So then everybody was from the group home and everybody was from the youth facility and then everybody had went to Spoffit. So it was like, okay, good. <laughs> that's what's up. So at what point did you actually meet Marley Marl? Um, I've known Marlon all my life. You know, uh, Molly's sister Belle lived on my block, which was 12th Street. Um, he lived in a building across from me and he worked in the Sergio Valente Jean Factory. So because he worked in the Sergio Valente Jean Factory, and that was like a very popular brand of jean then, when he said to me, um, for me to come to his house, he wanted me to do a freestyle over a beat real quick. You know, because he's like, listen, you know, I heard that you wanted the best. 
you know, I'm going to play this beat. Um, let me just hear you spit something. And so I just did Roxanne's Revenge right off the top of my head in the process of doing my laundry. Because I was actually doing laundry for my mother at that time. And I had recently returned home from the group home. So, you know, just wanted to make sure that you do everything right. So I was like, listen, I can't be late. I have to do this laundry. You know, otherwise she's going to have a fit and, you know, my consequences can be rather severe. So let me go and do this laundry. And he was like, this is only going to take like five minutes. And I was like, okay, look, I got seven minutes. And I actually did Roxanne's Revenge in seven minutes. One take, left, and then went back downstairs to do the laundry. So you basically freestyled it? Freestyled the entire song. Okay, so before that time, Marley Marl, was he working with other artists? Was there a juice crew around or not really? No, there wasn't a Juice Crew at that time, at least not one that I knew of. Like, I didn't find out the whole history of Juice Crew as far as it coming from Disco Fever and belonging to Sal Abatello and the process of getting a ring and becoming a real Juice Crew member. Like, I didn't know any of that at that time. Um, all I knew is that Marley had really big speakers. He used to put them in his window. When he played music, that was what was going to be the mood of the block for the day. So like if Marley woke up early in the morning and he wanted to play disco, then the whole damn day was going to be disco and everybody was going to, you know, do disco moves. If he decided that it was going to be roller skating day, then every song was going to be your roller skating day. So Marley was just known as the music of the projects and mainly of my block because it was on 12th Street. Before you did Roxanne's Revenge, UTFO did the song Roxanne, Roxanne. Yes. And that became a hit record. Yes. Uh, I believe uh, Full Force produced it. Roxanne, Roxanne, that was their first single because it was what, hanging out with Roxanne, Roxanne on the B-side? Yeah, that was the first single. It's so funny because um, one of the people that was very influential in that being the first single, he was with us last week. Uh, I remember uh, we was trying to decide which would be the single, so I called DJ Red Alert. It was about 1 o'clock in the morning, and I asked him what he thought about it. And he said, um, at that time, uh, Beats and Rhymes was going to be the one we wanted to go with, which was the A-side. Like Paul was saying, we was talking to Red Alert, right. and Red Alert was playing on the radio, Roxanne, Roxanne, when he should have been playing, we thought, he should have been playing Hanging Out. And we're like, you're playing the wrong record. No, that, I said, that's the B-side. Well, I like the B-side. Red was saying, I like the B-side. Well, he was saying very sleep. He was like, he was like uh, I like the B-side. I know Red, but the one that we're going to, Zelda said, well, I'm going to play the B-side. B -side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which was Roxanne, Yo, Roxanne. Red, Red Alert broke Roxanne, Roxanne. Yeah, exactly. Period. Okay. So Roxanne, Roxanne comes out. Mm-hmm and it goes crazy. And then Roxanne Chante suddenly comes out of nowhere yep. hmm. and does a response record. Then you had this sort of phenomenon right. that you've never seen before, before right. or since in music, where you had like 25 different response records to Roxanne yeah. Roxanne. It was like Roxanne's dog, Roxanne's Sparky mother. D. There was like Rox Roxanne's a Roxanne band. dance. Like, then we was... jumped on our own bandwagons and we came out with the real Roxanne. Yeah. And they had the girl on it, which later on became the real Roxanne, but she wasn't even really named in the song. It was just a UTFO song, right? Right. UTFO, this is how the whole um, situation went. UTFO created a fictitious character named Roxanne. And it happened to be over the big beat. So when Molly played the big beat for me, automatically when you heard boom, boom, bah, boom, boom, bah, you thought Roxanne, Roxanne. So because I was doing a freestyle, I heard the big beat and I said, okay. He said, so what you gonna rhyme about? I said, I don't know. And then once I heard the boom, boom, I said, well, my name is Roxanne, or don't you know? And that started it, so I brought her to life. So once I gave her a life and I gave her, I guess, you know, created a, made her real, then we started selling a lot of albums. Full Force decided to come up with their own real Roxanne because I actually started making more money than UTFO than the original record. So they came out with the real Roxanne, which also helped uh, spawn like 86 other records that were all coming at Roxanne Shantae. So whether it was Roxanne's a man, Roxanne's baby, Roxanne's doctor, Roxanne's parents, Roxanne's this, you know, and um, because I was already a battle rapper, it was easy for me to have so many records coming at me all negative and it not affect me 
Because a lot of times people say, well, you know, you're only 14 years old. And if everything that you listen to and everything you hear on the radio is something mean or something bad and no one's coming to the rescue and no one's coming out to help Roxanne, you know, how do you feel? And I said, you know, I just feel like hip hop. You know, that's that's what it is, you know. Right. I mean, I mean, that was like a phenomenon that's never really happened again. It's like you and it came won't. up with a you know response record and then literally like a hundred records came out all about you. And, right. And then what's so know, crazy this, this about character. it is that everyone felt that if you make a record about Roxanne Shante, she's going to respond. So it was actually um, an open door for a lot of people to get into the industry because they knew that if you make a record and you mention Shante, she's going to respond like as if literally like she can't help it. And, and to a certain, you know, and to a certain extent, they were right. Like. If I heard they was like, listen, you know, this Roxanne in Baltimore says she wants to battle. I'm like, all right, cool. Let's go to Baltimore. And then you go to Baltimore, you battle her, you get rid of her. Then you go to North Carolina, you battle her, you get rid of her. You go South Carolina, you battle them, you get rid of them. You know, and then it was just a fact of wanting to come into the industry and just be a great rapper. This was before they came up with the term female rapper, because before me, there was no such title as female rapper. Everybody was just rappers and MCs. There was no such thing as boy and girl. That wasn't, they didn't have that title then. And I remember the day when the term female rapper was created. Really? Yeah, I was actually, um, it was the new music seminar and it was a rap battle for world supremacy. And at that time, hip hop, had such strong roots and hip hop had stretched such um there was there was rules to hip hop and one of the rules was in order to be the greatest you had to have already eliminated all of the greats you could not hold that title unless you had did that you know like now everybody could come out and be the king of this and you could be the king of that and you could be the best this and you could be the best that but back in the days it was only one way it was only one king one best one top mc that was it and I remember entering into that contest and a lot of the rappers had already known of me, especially the ones that were on there, like your Busy B, your Kumo D's, your, your uh, Fuquans. You know, these were considered all the greatest rappers at that time. And they were like, um, Roxanne Shantae entered. And they was like, who, the girl with the braces? Because I had braces for like forever. Like going through the group home, we didn't have, I didn't have like a, a, a set orthodontist because at that time people didn't really get braces from the hood. You know, it's like you just grew up, you know, sucking your thumb, that was it. So I was known as the, the rapper with the braces. And um, they was like, who, the girl with the braces? And they was like, yeah. They was like, all right, well, you know what? Let her battle everyone. So instead of everyone having separate opponents, it was me against everyone all day up until it was down to just me and Busy B. And I, I was going for world supremacy and I knew that it was a title that I was supposed to have. And so I had got nines and tens and the ability to be able to have what was called the Nipsey Russell syndrome, where you could just make up rhymes about anything on spot. It gave me that leverage because whatever they wrote that was written, if I cut them off, it threw them off. You know, if you if I if I say something about their clothes, it threw them off. If I said something about me taking a moment to drink water, it threw them off. If I said something about somebody in the crowd, it threw them off. So it was it was like a, a process of elimination as far as I was concerned. And when it got down to Busy B, I remember um, the judges were like Grandmaster Cass and uh, it was uh, Curtis Blow. And the reason why Curtis Blow stands out is because. I recall Curtis Blow saying, like, how can she lose? And they said, well, you know, the only way she's going to lose is if she gets a two. But it's no way. She's been getting nines and tens all day. So there's no way. And he was like, oh, so a two and she would lose. And they was like, yeah. And so he took out his board and he wrote the number two on it. And when he wrote the number two on it, I looked over. And, you know, they said that busy one and people were booing and they had to take Curtis out the back door, you know, because people were actually it was almost like being in a Rocky fight where I have been going through this all day long and I'm down to the end and my voice is almost gone. And I'm and I, at the time I'm 15 years old, 14, 15 years old. And people are like cheering for me, like, oh, my God, this little girl is getting ready to be the best in the world. And um, and I lost. And I think that day. I lost some of my love for hip hop, some of my respect for hip hop, 
because I always thought that it went by how talented you were and how great you were. And if you were good at it, then this is what you were going to be. And, and that's how I felt. So years later, you know, um, and I think that made me feel a certain way how I felt about the industry after that. And um, years later, many, many years later, and, and I love Curtis today. You know, we're the best of friends. We work a lot on, uh, we serve on a lot of boards together, hip hop boards. And um, he said to me, recently he said to me, he said, you know, I let me explain to you what happened that day. So I told him, I said, listen, you know, life is good for Roxanne and Shantae. I don't complain. You know, I'm good. So um, I'm not angry, and you don't have to explain your decision back then. You know, I'll chalk it up to hip-hop. I'll just leave it at that. He said, no, no, no. He said, you know, God has put it heavy on my heart. Let me please explain to you why I did that that day. And I said, no, it's okay. Now, my husband's a retired boxer, you know. So my husband was like, nah, let him explain because I want to hear it. And I'm like, nah, babe, let's just let it go. You know, I'm blessed. We're blessed. Let it go. He's like, no, no, no. Go ahead, Curtis, tell us. And so he said, listen, at that time, hip hop was brand new. Hip hop was just starting to be um, accepted in um, as far as a true genre of music. Hip hop is finally starting to go mainstream. Major labels are starting to finally give us deals and they are finally starting to take us serious. And there was just no way that they were going to continue to take hip hop serious if the best in the world was a 15 year old girl. They were not going to do that, Shante. So right. I'm sorry that, that I did that that day, but I did that for, for hip hop. It wasn't that I had anything against you, he said. And if you would have talked to me any time after that, I would have explained that to you. But I couldn't explain it to you that day. He said, because you you just you wasn't you wasn't trying to hear it. He said, and I think that's the reason why I needed to explain it to you now so you can understand why I did that. So, you know, I understood that I had to be that sacrifice for hip hop. And, you know, and I remember that day everybody pat me on the back. Well, listen, you know what? You still gonna be the best female rapper ever. You the best female rapper. You know, that's how we see it. You the best female. There ain't no girl better than you. You know, and that's when the title female rapper came out. And, um, you know, and I understand because hip hop at that time was given an expiration date, unlike any other music. They was always told to us that, you know, this, mu this music has five years and then it's going to be over. This music is not going to be around in 10 years. Hip hop is the only music that you are supposed to outgrow in order to prove that you are now an adult or in order to prove that you have now matured. If it wasn't for um, technology coming along or or I guess if you wanted to say, if it wasn't for that turn of events where those who became in power happened to be huge hip hop fans, they may have still felt that way about hip hop. But now you can go into some of these large Fortune 500 companies and they're playing Wu-Tang in their office. Like when you go and meet the CEO, he has hip hop blasting. I remember being in hip hop, I remember being in hip hop at a time where people would blast hip hop all the way until they got to their job parking lot and then they switched to jazz just to prove that they were all grown up, you know? Yeah. So, so I come from that era of hip hop. So, so you know, Roxy and Shantae understands that. I understand that true sacrifice for hip hop. And, um, you know, still today, I can't say that I'm upset that he did that, though I know what my place would have been. And who says how, I, how hip hop would have been differently if he would have done that? So um, if, if it took that that day to help hip hop get to where it is today, then, then I'm fine. And, you know, and, and, and I'm blessed to have been a part of that. And because I'm okay. And when I say I'm okay, I think I stress that a lot because a lot of times people always think that old school artists are doing bad or, you know, it's for some reason, they always think that old school hip hop artists is fucked up. Like they always think that something has happened to us or they always think that everybody has ran out of money or something has happened. You know, I haven't made records in over 30 years. And when I say I haven't made records in over 30 years, that means I haven't made records in over 30 years. But that doesn't mean that I have not been sampled. You know, I've been sampled by Nas, I've been sampled by Jay-Z, I've been sampled by J. Cole, I've been sampled by Black Eyed Peas, I've been sampled by Janet Jackson, I've been sent, you know, so, so as long as they continue to go platinum, I go platinum every year from some artists sampling me. You know, so when you walk into my home, you look on my wall, you're like, well, what did you have to do with that? 
And what did you have to do with that album? You know, like my kids take a lot of pride when they walk into my music room like, yeah, you know, my mom was on that album. Yeah, my mom was on that album. You know, and, and this comes from like some new artist that I may not even, um, you know, I'm a fan of every artist. I must say, but you know, these may have been artists that I've never would have crossed paths with had they not sampled my work, let alone doing voiceovers for video games, you know? So, you know, when I say that I'm good and I stress that point, you know, I just want other artists to know that when it comes to this hip hop genre, it is so big. There's so many things that you can do in this industry that just because you don't see someone with the hottest video doing mobile rap, doesn't mean that they're not making money. Roxanne's Revenge comes out. Yes, it does. Ends up selling like 250,000 copies? It sold more than that. It was actually, it actually went platinum, but they okay. uh, sold 250,000 here in New York. Mm. So, okay. you know, so people were looking at it like, oh my God, like this really, and none of the record companies in New York would give me a chance because of my, um, battle rep reputation from before. So like a lot of the other rappers were like, no, I don't want her on my label. No, I don't want her on my label. So I wind up signing to like the most gangster label, which was Pop Art Records back in the day, you know, out of Philadelphia, because they didn't care. They was like, listen, you can make records about whatever you want, talk about whoever you want. You don't have to worry about your voice being clean. You don't have to worry about not using profanity. You know, do what you want. You know, this is Pop Art, we do what we want. So okay. Like, okay, so right. So then UTFO puts out a response record with the real Roxanne. Yes, they did. And then you start dropping response records, and you start actually, you know, dissing other established hip hop acts. So you diss Run DMC, LL Cool J, Curtis Blow. <laughs> so you were going at all the big artists at the time. Absolutely. I think what it was was just to prove a point that um, I was never afraid to say names. See, everyone else started doing disc records and then you had to guess who they were talking about. I never wanted anybody to guess who I was talking about. And I never wanted anyone to be angry if they shouldn't be. Like if I didn't say your name, it wasn't about you. I say names. You know, I've always been a person to say names. And they would always say like, oh, that's that group home girl mentality. That's just how she is. You know, she doesn't care. And it wasn't that. It was that I felt that for respect of the art form of hip hop, that I am supposed to say your name. I'm not, you're not supposed to guess when I call you out. That's like going into a fight and I punched him in the face, but I really wanted to fight you. That just doesn't make sense to me, you know? So, um, and when it came to the Roxanne's, I didn't make it my business to do response records. I made it my business to show up at their shows and and do my responses there during their shows. So after a while, um, even including the real Roxanne, they wouldn't perform anymore. And I think that was the reason why I wind up being the last Roxanne standing because I would find out that they had a show and I would just show up and show out. But I'm not like that no more. I'm all grown up now. I don't I don't do those things, you know. I'm I'm all grown up now, you know. Okay, so. <laughs> Was uh, Roxanne's Revenge, was that Marley Marl's first like record or first hit record? No, actually it wasn't. Marley had made records before then. Uh, it may have been the first big record. Okay. It may have been the first, uh, I guess you want to say, breakout record for him as a producer. Um, to make his name known. But no, he had created uh, music before then. You know, Marley is incredible. One of the greatest hip hop producers ever. You know, and I'm not just saying that because he's my brother. You know, a lot of times people look at the fact of the Juice Crew and they say, oh, you guys are always taking up for each other. You always talk good about each other. You know, you always claim that they are the best to you because that's what you always say. And then you say, no, but mm, they are. You, They really are. You can't. I can't take away from that. You know, my, my, my Juice Crew brothers are phenomenal. I don't, I don't find any shows that I like better than theirs. You know, um, I don't find any lyrics that I like better than theirs or production that I like better than theirs. Okay, so let's talk about the Juice Crew. So at what okay. point did you start to join the Juice Crew and the whole Juice Crew came together? Because, I mean, the Juice Crew had some of the greatest MCs of all time. You had Big Daddy Kane. You had Cool G Rap. Absolutely. You had... 
Ma- you know, Master Ace, MC Shan. I mean, who else? Tragedy Craig Gaddafi. G- Craig G, Tragedy Gaddafi. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, we became called the Juice Crew because Mr. Magic's name was Sir Juice. And the Juice Crew originated from the fever with Sal Abatello. He had what he called the Juice Crew. These were people who he considered had juice, and he would give them a ring, and they would actually go through it. There was like a whole ritual that they went through in order to get a Juice Crew ring. So we were not original Juice Crew members because Sal didn't see us as that. So what Sal called us was Juice Crew All-Stars because we were all stars but we were members of the Juice Crew. So he called us the Juice Crew All-Stars. So that's why when we made a record about it, we were called the Juice Crew All-Stars. And um, because Mr. Magic's name was Sir Juice, he was Sir Juice and we were his crew. So we became the Juice Crew All-Stars. So we were named after Magic. Uh-huh. Aha. You know, even though I, I was actually given a ring from Sal, at the fever, one of one of the only girls to have been given a ring, but that was because I spent a lot of time at the fever and I put in a lot of fever time. So now the Juice Crew is forming. Yes. You guys are doing your thing. Yes. And then Boogie Down Productions start to have issues with y'all because Boogie Down Productions wanted to be members of the Juice Crew and ah. were not allowed. Aha! I didn't know that. Yes. Okay, so uh, Karis One and all of them actually wanted to be down with Marley Marl. Right. They wanted to be part of the Juice Crew, and Magic took their record and broke it on air and said no, because that's how he would tell people if they could be part, if they could be down, or if they couldn't. So he cracked their record and was like, I don't like it, I don't like it, I don't like it. And then before we knew it, they were like, oh, so since we can't be part of the crew, we're going to go at the crew. And this is how we're going to do it. And so okay. that's when they came in. Okay. Because then at one point, MC Shan dropped the bridge. Yes. And they felt that that would be the best way to attack it would be you saying that it came, hip hop started out in Queensbridge. When it didn't, it started up in the Bronx. But he never said that it started out in Queensbridge. He was just telling our Queensbridge story. But that was the leeway to get in. So um, that was out for a few weeks. Um, before he started that part. And then he was like, okay, you know what? I think they came back. I had went out of the country. And when I came back, they were like, oh my God. See, this is before technology. So, you know, we, I didn't get it over there. So when I came back home, they were like, did you hear this? And I was like, what? And then I heard, dun, 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 dun. I was like, what is that? Who is that? What is that? And then when it got to my part, I was like, where are they? Who is that? You know, and um, they was like, that's KRS-One. And that's called The Bridge is Over. And I remember it being on tape and it was played over and over. And you know, even back then, in order to listen to something over and over and over again, actually took some power. It's not like a push of a button like everything is today. So in order to hear it over and over again, you had to, Take it out, rewind it, put it in, play it again. Take it out, rewind it, put it in, play it again. You know, so you're like, oh my God, we got to do something about this. So I remember getting on the phone and calling Kane. I was like, Kane, did you hear this? He was like, I know, Shiny. I was like, no, you don't understand. Then I called Biz. I was like, Biz. He's like, don't worry, Shiny. I was like, no, y'all don't understand. And then I think maybe a few Weeks later, I bumped into Karis one at the bank. And I think he spoke about this in one of his interviews. He did, didn't he? Yeah, he spoke about his interview where I was like, I walked in the bank and I had my son at the time because I had my son very early in life. I think I was one of the first ones to have, even though I was the youngest in hip hop, I was the first one to have a baby and literally take him on tour, put him on album covers, put him inside of magazines. And I remember um, being there with my sister, I think it was like one of my little sisters at the time, and we're going into the bank, and I spot him. And as soon as I spot him, I'm like, hold a baby, and I'm ready to fight. Like, yeah, I was like, hold a baby. You know, that's the Shantae coming out of me. And he was like, hold up, hold up, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I was like, nah, nah, ain't no wait a minute now. We about to tear this bank up, you know? And because again, that's how I took hip hop. Okay, because on the bridge is over, 
you know, he starts naming all the different Juice Crew members, and then he gets to you, he said, Roxanne Shante is only good for steady fucking. Exactly. And because I had a baby, y'all knew that I was fucking. Right. <laughs> so, so it wasn't like I couldn't, it wasn't like, I, what could I say? <laughs> right, because Karis one, he talked about that in the Beef 2 DVD, which I think you were in Okay, also. yes. Right, and, and he said that you ran up on him at a bank. Yes. And you were basically like, yo, I never said your name. How are you going to say this type of shit? Yeah, you know, I, was, I, yeah I was ready. I and, was ready. And the way he described it, that he couldn't say nothing. Like all the macho bravado was just gone at that point. Yeah, it was. It was because I expected him to to say to say something like to defend it, to to be as rock. I, I expected him to speak like the bridge is over. I expected him to like, dee 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 You know, I thought we were just going to tear the bank up today. You know, like that's the way I expected it to go from that point. But he was like, you're right. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, he, he truly humbled himself. And I was like, yeah, don't talk about me no more. Like, yeah, I, I walked out of there feeling like, yeah, that's right. Now give me the baby. Let's go. Yeah, yeah. The thing about the bridge is over is that it was kind of like the back to back of that day. Yes. You know, the, the Drake back-to-back, -back, meaning that not only was it a hard diss record, but it kind of became a hit record. Yes, it did. Absolutely. 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 And then years later, when we would perform at shows, he would, he would get out there and he would actually try to change the lyrics. And I would pull him to the side and say, listen, you can't unwrite history. That's history right there. Get ahead out there and do it. Because I mean, listen, if it didn't break me when I was 15, it's damn sure not gonna do a damn thing to me now. So don't change it. And he was like, all right, Shiny. You know, all right, Shiny, I'm gonna go out there and do it. Yeah, because I was like, listen, don't do not do that. Don't change it, don't un, that's what's, so, that's what's so messed up about hip hop today is because everybody is rewriting the history. Everybody is changing it. Everybody is, is taking this out of it and adding this or, 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 or taking this away and not even putting anything else in it. So that's how come, you know, our history is being so rewritten and we can't afford to do that. So keep it truthful and just do it how it's supposed to be done because that's hip hop. And not only that, right. I remember being in a party and when they would play it, when that part would come on, everybody would be looking at me and I'd still be dancing and still be singing it because, you know, it's hip hop. Right. Absolutely. Now, and you actually responded to KRS on your own record. Yes. Yes. I did respond to uh, KRS one with Have a Nice Day, which happens to be one of the most popular records that I do um, when I do hostings and everything else. So, yeah. Right. And, and then other female rappers started going at you. Because I think at one point, J.J. Fad went at you. Yeah. And I guess Ice Cube was on the song also? Yes, absolutely. You know what it was? It was, again, it was um, in order to get into the industry or to make a mark, it was like, go at Roxanne Shante. And, you know, people like that. I had became the artist that people love to hate. And it, it, it took me a while to understand the power in that that with every good guy there's going to be a villain and and I, I understood that you know and, and being 15 and being able to understand that was was kind of difficult at first because I want to get on stage and I want everyone here to love me and I want everyone here to cheer for me and I want everyone here to be happy to see me like I don't want to always be the villain that has to come out and then turn the crowd around and um there used to be a TV show on, on, on television called Dynasty, and there were two main characters, which was one was called Crystal and one was called Alexis. And I remember talking to my mom, and my mom was like, listen, everybody watches Dynasty. Now, people love Crystal, but they watch it more when Alexis is on. So you are the Alexis. And I was like, but mom, if they don't like me, why are they here? She said, look at this place. And I mean, the place is packed. I mean, packed back to back. People can't get in the door. And if I'm the only person performing and no one likes me, why are they all in here? She said, because they pay not to like you. Yeah, and so, absolutely. You know, and so I kind of understood it and then I accepted it. And because of it, you know, I've always been just Roxanne Shantae. Never tried to change it to make people love me. Never tried to change it to make people like me, um, whether it was industry people 
or whatever. And, and now my fan base is, is incredible because people understood that I stayed, because so many people can identify with being a Roxanne Shante. Like Roxanne Shante is like when you go to a new job and you're very good at your job and nobody on the job likes you and you're trying really hard to get everyone to like you, then after a while you just say, fuck it, I'm just going to do my job. And then you start rising up in the ranks. Then before you know it, you own the company. Bam, Roxanne Shante factor. That's what you do. So people can identify with the Roxanne Shante factor. It's that factor of going in and knowing that you are great at what you do and you don't need validation from anyone else to make you know that you are great. So you don't need the award shows and you don't need the awards. You know, um, my album sales speak for themselves. You know, my the, the way I'm um, sampled speaks for itself. Um, the, the phone calls, the ability to work, um, me even having a movie that's produced by Forrest Whitaker and Pharrell Williams that um, we were only going to show it one day at Sundance. The response was so incredible. They had to show it for four days. People were flying in from all over just to see the movie in Utah. You know, during a blizzard, people were trying to get in, catching flights just to see the movie. You know, and then there was uh, 115 submissions. Only 13 movies were sold. And one of the movies that was sold was mine after a bidding war, you know, and, and we're not talking like a small bidding war. We're talking major companies bidding for the Roxanne Shante movie. So it just lets you know that that Roxanne Shante factor is a great thing to have. And sometimes we need to be able to show those who come behind us that, listen, it's OK not to be liked. It's okay not to fit in. It's okay to stand your ground and, and speak up for yourself and talk to people the way you need to talk to them so that this way they may not like you, but they will respect you. And in turn, they will support you. Now, you had a record called uh, Brothers Ain't Shit. Absolutely. And <laughs> what they say is that, you know, the Snoop and Dre record, Bitches Ain't Shit, is a response to that record. To my Brothers Ain't Shit, absolutely. Yes. Okay. And we knew that we knew I knew once I made Brothers Ain't Shit, we kind of like sat back and was like, now, who's going to answer Brothers Ain't Shit? And then all of a sudden we heard bitches ain't shit, but hoes and tricks. I was like, OK, good. Write that down. That's another one <laughs> on the list. Got them. <laughs> you know, right. sometimes after a while, it started like I would make records to see who was going to respond and then be like, cool, got them. <laughs> you know, <laughs> cool. Gotcha. Okay. I mean, you were actually, I guess, the original internet troll, in a way. Absolutely. You were the original hip-hop troll. Yeah. I guess. And, I and it worked. You, and you know what? And, and as you know, and some people may see that negatively. Some people may see it positively. You know, my factor is understanding the ability of having, you know, the Roxanne Shante factor. Right. Right. Because Bitches Ain't Shit was on Dr. Dre's The Chronic. Yes. Which many people consider to be the greatest hip hop album of all time. Absolutely. You know, and if not, if they don't consider that, it's definitely in people's top five and top tens. Like that was just an absolutely amazing piece of work. Yes, it was. So, so congrats on that. So, because at one point you dropped the Big Mama record where you dissed Queen Latifah, Yo-Yo, MC Light, Moni Love. You were basically going at everybody. I think you know what it is. I think that was my way of... Um giving my, uh, my goodbye kisses to the industry. And I just, I just didn't want anybody to feel left out. I didn't want anybody to feel like I didn't, I, you know, I wanted everybody to feel special. I didn't want, you know, me and Yo-Yo, who happen to be best friends now, um, we talked about that. Like that day before I dropped Big Mama, I had took her out to eat. We went skating. You know, we had hung out. And then the next day she heard Big Mama. And she was like, I thought we were friends. I was like, we are. And that's why I wanted to make sure that you went down in history. How could I leave you out? I can't leave you out of this. You were dissing your friends. Okay. That's, that's a little different. That's what's up. So did any of these girls actually respond? Well, you know, um, I had already left the industry. So no, to my knowledge, they did. I mean, if they did, they may have said little things here, little things there. But there was never no just straight out, you know. At 15 years old, you have a baby. Yes. How difficult was that to be a baby with a baby? Um, I, had, I was already very maternal. I had already taken care of my sisters. So it wasn't difficult as far as a mom standpoint. And being a hip-hop artist, 
it actually made it a little bit easier for me because I didn't have to worry about how he was going to eat, how I was going to support him, what I was going to do. Um, you know, I kept him in a Dapper Dan outfits. You're talking like $1,000 a pop at that time, you know, $1,500 a pop. I wish somebody would have whispered in my ear like, he's going to have to go to college one day. Put that aside, you know. <laughs> but I guess no one didn't want to say that. But um, he became hip hop's baby. And because my juice crew was so very close to me, he had his uncles around constantly. So, and I, when I would perform, I took him with me on the tour. So taking him on the road with me, a lot of people felt that, you know, I had some parents picketing, saying that I was promoting a uh, teen pregnancy. And then I had some magazines that refused to put me on the cover because I refused to go on the cover without him. You know, I was like, I won't go on the cover without him. So they were like, oh, well, then we'll put you in the magazine, but we won't put you on the cover. And I was like, OK, well, put me wherever you want to. But the fact is, if I can't put him with me on the cover, then I'm not. And I think it was just a way of me showing that my me being that young and still being that maternal, it kept me from a lot of things. And he literally, I would say, saved my life as far as I'm concerned, because I watched so many fall at the wayside. Like, Roxanne Shantae couldn't drink because I have a baby, so I have to take care of him. And Roxanne Shantae didn't go to the after parties because there are no after parties for me, because after the, after the show, I'm going straight to the hotel room because I have a baby. You know, um, Roxanne Shantae is not gonna smoke cigarettes and do this and do that because I already took my responsibility with me on the road. So he literally saved my life, he did. Because who's to say, you know, if every time you meet a man, no matter what age they are, and you're age 14 and they all wanna be your man, you know, that's gotta be creepy after a while. You're, you're, you're 14 years old, you meet a man 60. Roxanne, Roxanne, I wanna be your man. You know, and you're like, oh my goodness, man 60, help. You know, and then, you know, you meet somebody 20 year old Roxanne, I'm saying, you know, I just want to be your man. Everybody want to be your man. Everybody want to be your man, you know. So then I just, you know, had a little man of my own. So it's like, you know, I'm, I'm good. I'm fine, you know. Um, and so it's, it's ironic that now they have shows like Teen Mom where they put it out there, where when I did it, you was like, no. But unlike these teen moms, I showed a teen mom that took care of their child, worked every day, tried to set the right example. And even though I have pictures of me and him in the club three, four o'clock in the morning, that was me taking him to work with me. You know, that was him five years old in the club, you know, with, a, with, a, with some Coca-Cola and a whole bunch of cherries inside of his cup in the picture, holding up his cup, you know. But the fact was, I never drank, I never smoked, you know, and, and the fellas, also made sure that everything was child friendly. Like my studio sessions were done during the day, you know, and if I had to go in the studio late at night, he'd sleep on a pile of coats, you know, so um, he was a blessing and it was not hard at all. Well, at one point you started going through some domestic abuse though. Yes. Okay. But that wasn't Was that with the father of, of your son or something? Yes, else? Yes, it was, but that wasn't because of him. Like okay. that wasn't, the, the difficulties was not, because of my son. The difficulties was that sometimes, as many female artists do, when you, um, like I never understood at first why female, a lot of your female stars or your female artists tend to always want to marry other stars or marry other artists. You know, I never understood that until I was in that type of relationship where if they do not understand what it is you do, for some reason, they start to resent you for your popularity. They start to resent you for all the Roxanne, Roxanne, I want to be your man. You know, and my thing was, you're upset with me. Why not be upset with him? He's the one who said it. I just made the record. You know, why, why want to fight me and not fight them? You know, and so, yeah, yeah I, I did. I went through uh, domestic violence. Um, and, I, and being a teenager at the time and feeling like, no one wanted to rescue me from it. You know, that was, that was the most difficult part to deal with. Yeah, I mean, how bad did it get in terms of the violence? Um, it, it had got pretty bad. I mean, I had been hospitalized and went through a lot, yeah. Oh, wow, so he actually put you in the hospital? Yes. I mean, what was it like 
with your son watching mommy get beat up by dad? Um, he was, when, by the time I left, my son was not even talking. My son was still, uh, still a baby. He was, um, he was about maybe two when I left. And, um, I can't say, cause I made his childhood so great after that that I hoped and prayed that it kind of washed any remnants of that away because he didn't remember any of that. It, was, it actually wasn't until he seen the movie that he started to tell me like, I think I remember that, or I remember that part, or I remember that specifically, you know, and um, it wasn't until he actually was able to see it up on a big screen because there were a lot of days for filming that I didn't want to go because I didn't want to relive it again. But I knew how important it was for someone to be able to see that for, for another, because there's some young female artist out there right now that needs to get away from, you know, the manager, you know, that, that she doesn't feel like she can or all of a sudden she just gives up on her career in order because a lot of female artists they don't give up on their career because they're not good at what they do they give up on their career because they just don't want to go through no more so they just say forget it i don't want to sing no more forget it i don't want to rap no more forget it i don't want to perform no more you know and so i think that it was very important that i shared that part of my life that part of my story i tell people all the time the roxanne Chante. Um, story, you know, like my life is an open book. It's just not an easy read. You just need to read some other shit before you read mine so that you can have a better understanding um, and, and how to deal with it. But um, as far as my son goes, um, he's grown up to be, you know, a, 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 a young man that that I love, truly love and respect. Like we go out a lot of places together because I truly enjoy his company. You know, I don't know how many parents can say that they enjoy the company of their children. Like me and my son and my husband, we're like huge boxing fans. And you know, so we go to the fights, you know, you'll see us at the fights. And you know, and, and, and because I've been good to people, um, I still get really good seats. You know, I, I tell people all the time, how you treat people when your record is hot is how they treat you when it's not. And I've always been very good to people. So the people that I happen to be good to happen to be the ones in charge of everything now. So, you know, I still get great seats, you know, and, um, you know, we'll go out and enjoy stuff. So, you know, life is good all around. Absolutely good. What do you think was that the final straw that made you leave your son's father where it was like, okay, at this point I'm out. Because when you have a child, I mean, you do want the father around for a, a lot of different reasons. So right. what was it that made you finally say, that's it, I'm going to do this on my own? Well, my ribs were broke. So oh, wow. I didn't think I was, I didn't think he was going to keep me around. You know, I felt that um, the violence had escalated to such a point that I wasn't sure if I was going to be around. So it was best that I left because this, you know, it got to the point where I felt that, you know, he, this man doesn't even like me. You know, it's, 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 it's bad enough when the love is gone, but then when they don't even like you, you know, and, and I'm like, and I'm 16, 17 years old, like I know that this is not, I didn't go through all of that for it to end here like this. It's just no way. It's no way. I didn't go from, from, from abused child, group home girl, uh, battle rapper, Roxanne, Chante, becoming a whole Roxanne, Roxanne for it to end here. No, it's just no way. So that was kind of like, that was the, the, the breaking point for me, you know, because I had never got a chance to be a child. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm sorry you had to go through that. That sounds horrible. I, I took my share, but um, I also say in the end that, um, but I'm here and, and, and I survived it to tell the story. And, you know, um, everything happens. You know, every, people always say, well, you know, everything happens for a reason. And that's true. But you don't have to endure it to wait for the reason. You know, like, look, right. look I, that's enough for me. Like, okay, I, I tapped out. I'm good. You know, that's all right for me. You know. Okay, so you started at 15. You, you did your thing. But then at 25, you ended up just leaving the industry altogether. Yes. What was, like, the final straw that made you say, forget rap, even though you had such a high degree of success, especially at the time when hip-hop was still so new? Um... The reason why by that time I was already 
done was because I had never gotten a royalty check. So one day I was having a conversation with some other artists and it was like, yeah, well, you know, we get these royalty checks. And I'm like, what? What are those? And they were like, all the records that you've sold, you don't have, you never got a royalty check. And I was like, no. And then I went to the record company and I was like, hey, uh, what about my royalties? They was like, oh, you go ask them. And then I go and the next week, hey, hey, what about my royalties? Oh, no, go ask them. And then I go, hey, listen, what happened? What's, what about the royalties? And they was like, oh, listen, um, well, because you were underage, we gave some money to your mother. We gave some money to such and such. Uh, you weren't supposed to get this. Um, this wasn't registered. And I was like, okay, you know what? I'm good. I'm done. So you got robbed, basically. You got yeah, robbed. Yeah, exactly. So I was like, listen, because it's hard to go and tell your manager that your record company is doing you dirty when your manager is your record company. And then it's hard to tell him that when uh, the brother is your accountant and the best friend is your lawyer. And so you you go and you tell them, but then all they do is laugh amongst each other. Like, yeah, listen, you knew one day she was gonna ask. you know. And so that was the case. And then I just backed away and I started taking care of my paperwork, started taking care of my publishing and my writers. And then, you know, um, God just made it where, regards to what they stole then, is nowhere near what I make now or what I've made now, you know? Like, people say, well, don't you wish you would have gotten it all then? And I'm like, no, because I probably, if they would have paid me then, I might have had enough money to get high. And since I couldn't afford to get high, <laughs> and I couldn't afford to drink, and I couldn't afford to splurge, it allowed me to have a certain humbleness about myself. I stayed uh, very grounded. So then, now, I'm in a better position as an artist, as a person, um, to appreciate the finances I have now than if I would have had them then. So I think it was okay. it was almost like God's way of putting it in the bank and then allowing to make sure that I got it and then some. Okay. Now, you mentioned in an interview, I think with Jezebel, that you felt that Marley Marl took advantage of you? Um, I don't want to just say Marley Marl in general. If I said anything about Marley, I love Marley, and Marley will always be my brother. Was I a little hurt? Absolutely. I was hurt because when he found out what the record company was doing, he didn't sound the alarm. Because you brought me into this industry. You brought me to this record company. You brought me to these people. You brought me to this management. You brought me to this accountant. When you found out that they were not right and you decided to leave, why didn't you tell me? And then I guess it would be the fact that you wouldn't tell me because you knew I would tell everyone else. But why wouldn't you tell me? Why wouldn't you say, listen, Shani, they stealing. Listen, Shani, they not doing right. Listen, Shani, I'm leaving. You should go too. You know, instead of leaving me thinking that everything was okay. You know, that that's how I felt. You know, um, I don't point out just any one person. You know, um, I just would like to say collectively that you know, everybody played their part in it. Those who had the, those who were in the position to play the part in it, played the part in it. But again, you know, my love for Molly just made that part hurt more because I just felt like if it was vice versa, I would have done it. I would have told. I would have said yeah. something. You know, I'm like, literally, that's what they consider me like. I know that there's a lot of places that people won't invite me and there's a lot of things that people won't have me at because I'm the truth. And when I say I'm the truth, it's because it's hard to live a lie when the truth is in the room because you're not sure of what I'm going to say or what I'm going to react to. So because of that, they rather not have me there so that they can be comfortable. And um, I would have told, you know, if I like today, when I find out that one thing is done, I tell everyone, like, yo, listen, rights a nation, we all get paid the same thing. My check just came in the mail. Did you get your check? And they'd be like, no. And I don't have a problem with telling how much it is. You know that old, don't tell people how much you got and don't tell people what it is that you, I tell it in a minute, like, listen, 
This is what my check was. Did you get yours? Because I'm that type of person. You know, I, I feel like we all work hard. We all put, you know, this is our creativity. This is our talent. And we're supposed to be compensated for it. And I believe that it's supposed to be fair. But in the entertainment industry, um, it's not always fair. And, you know, some people can be paid to not tell you that it's not fair. There's a biopic coming out yes. about your life. Yes. You know, which, which you've, you know, touched on before. Yes. Now, and I'm looking at the cast of this film, and this yes. is like no joke. I mean, you have Mershala Ali in it. Yes. This is right after he won the Oscar for yes. Moonlight. Yes. Who are the other people in this film? Uh, we have Nia Long. We Nia Long. Nia Long, absolutely. She plays my mother in the movie. Um, Mershala Ali, he plays, he actually plays uh, my son's father in the movie. And he told me that that was one of the most difficult parts he's ever had to play. You know, like after he would shoot a scene, he would come over to me and hug me. He'd tell me like, this is one of the hardest, you know, parts I've ever had to play. And he was like, you know, thank you. And I was like, he, cause he would, it would take him a moment to have to get out of character, you know, and, and, I, was, and I understood, you know, because I lived it. And then, um, Shante Adams, who happened to get um, the Sundance Award for Brand New Breakout Artist for this part. Yeah, uh, she, uh, she played you. She played me, and her name is Shante Adams. And what's so crazy about it is that she actually, um, she walked in, she said her name was Shante. I looked at her, and I was like, yeah, she is. She's Shante. Like, she was literally born for the part of Roxanne Shante. How much, how... She was named Shante. So, you know, her parents seen her as Shante. Wait, so did her parents name her after you or, or no? Um, no, actually they didn't. They just, they looked at her and said she was going to be Shante. You mentioned Pharrell is behind it. Forrest uh, Whitaker. For Forrest Whitaker is behind it. Yes. Uh, this, is, this is quite a big Mimi project. Mimi Valdez, Nina Bon Jovi. Uh, it has, it's been an incredible queen of queens. Is one of the production companies. It's it was an incredible process. Like, it was done in less. It was done in like a year. We talked about it. Um, we signed. We agreed. Um, it was written, and then it was done, and then it was in Sundance. Like everything just happened, like just like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the best projects usually do that. Yes, yes. Now, are you still in contact with your son's father? He's deceased. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. But what was it like you and your son watching this and watching these violent events and the domestic abuse play out on the screen and, and so forth and having to relive all that? Um, well, when we were watching the movie together, I had um, my husband on one side of me, I had my son on the other side of me. And um, when something would happen, my husband would squeeze my hand. And then I'd look over at my son and I would squeeze his hand and I'm like, you okay? He's like, I'm good. I was like, okay. I think that, because that was my first time seeing it completed was at Sundance and I chose to do it that way because I wanted to see it with an audience. And the audience knew that I was there. So when certain parts would happen, it was like everybody would look at me like the KRS-One record part, like, ugh, <laughs> you know? And I'm trying to sit there, you know, and, and, and my, my husband has tears coming out of his eyes and I'm trying to stay focused, and I'm keep watching my son's reaction. And um, all I kept saying was, this was just the perfect time. I'm at the perfect place. I'm surrounded by the perfect people. This was the perfect production company. These were the perfect actors, you know. And um, hopefully some, some young girl is going to look at the movie and say, okay, you know, this has been enough for me. This is the perfect time for me to go. And, and that's what the movie was done for. That's what it is. It sounds like a hell of a movie. I can't wait until I see it. Absolutely, absolutely. Roxanne Shante, definitely an honor to be Thank speaking you, with you today. Best of luck, uh, you know, and look forward to seeing more big things for you in the future. Thank you, sweetie. Thank you. That's what it is. Peace. Peace.